Yes. Oh, they all stand in love for a root canal. Come on now. <laughs> Ain't God good? All the time. <clears throat> We're going to finish up where we start last week. I challenge you, if you're having a problem getting past your past, if you have a problem getting past your pain, if you have a problem moving forward and you're always, instead of moving, always moving backwards instead of forward, I know it might be a struggle at times, but if you can get here on Tuesday nights, we're getting ready to get into the, the mindfulness now, cognitive behavioral therapy. But we're not going to call it that. We're just saying, figure out how to live now. Amen? Amen? All right. So, uh, but we're already doing stuff heading that way, talking about Mary and Martha, and I'm going to preach on Mary and Martha next week. So, here, but we also do it on Tuesday nights. He said, well, how can you keep preaching and teaching on the same Bible scripture? Well, it's the same Bible. Amen. It's always, got, it's always got the same good stuff in it. Amen. All right. Get your Bible out. Stand for the reading of the Word. Luke 23. We're going to finish where we were last week. Let's see if that got the right date on it. Yep. Luke chapter 23. God is so good. Amen. Luke 23. You know, I heard somebody talk about someone being 85. My little brother Billy was 90. And all I can think about was this uh, about an 85, 86 year old man went fishing and he heard, he heard this voice down beside him. And he kept hearing that voice and it said, Pick me up, pick me up, pick me up. And trying to look and it was a frog. And so he picked up the frog and the frog said, Pick me up and I'll become a beautiful bride. The frog put in his pocket. He's walking down the road, and the frog said, the frog said, didn't you hear me? Pick me up, kiss me, and I'll become a beautiful bride. He said, I'm 87 years old. I get more joy out of a talking frog. <laughs> All right. Okay. Luke chapter 23, verse 26. And they led him away. They laid hold of, as they led him away, they laid hold of one Simon, a, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and over him they laid the cross, that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people. Let me go. Let's just go on down a little bit. Let's go to 33. And when he had come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Put your hands this way. It's got for a special touch. And the Lord and Father, we love you. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We know, God, it's not by accident that we are here today. <clears throat> and we know, God, that you're powerful and you've got all things under control. I ask you right now, Lord, to minister to all of us in a very powerful way. Lord, use us in a very powerful way today. Lord, help us keep our mind on now. Not yesterday, not tomorrow. On now. Don't worry about what's going to happen after service. Don't think about what's going on during service where you're not at. Now is the challenge. So we can get what we want and what we need out of God's work. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said, Amen. On the way down, shake somebody's hand, tell them, if you're not here after what I'm here after, you'll be here after I'm gone. Tell them. You know, uh, <coughs> part of this uh, <coughs> part of this training that's coming up on Tuesday nights <coughs> is getting you to live in the here and now. <coughs> Praise God, I weren't even coughing much until I got here. Uh, so what's going on is, as I was to say, is people, people generally, and I told this on Tuesday night, I'm going to tell it tonight, too, and I'll talk about it next week. People generally should live, 80% 80, 80 of their minds should be in now. 10% in the past, 10% in the future. 80% now. But I guarantee you sitting here right now, some of y'all are 80% in the past right now. Some of you are 80% in the future. Some of you are wondering what's going to happen this afternoon. What am I going to eat? Are we going to beat the badgers to McDonald's? <laughs> well, you know what? I left something there at the house that I turned it on and I turned it off. You know, all these things you got to go in your mind. So when you're sitting through worship service, if you're not careful, you're not in the now. You're everywhere else. And so because you're everywhere else, your mind's everywhere else. You really can hear me, but you don't hear me. 
It deflects off your heart. Oh, you're hearing it through your ears, but it deflects off your heart. When it deflects off your heart, then the challenge that you receive today and the, the guidance that you receive today and the comfort that you receive today are going to be minor because you're everywhere else in your mind. I have a bad, I got ADHD. I'm bad about this. I have to purposely sit down and keep my mind centered. I was listening a while ago. It was tickling me. Marina looked over at me at D.C. and Brandon said, all right, y'all, leave the squirrels alone. Get back to earth. Okay, so so again, I'm asking y'all right now, leave the squirrels alone. If you really want to get something out of this, if you really want to leave this place and say, wow, I'm so glad that I went to God's house today, and I'm so glad that I heard that message. That's why we play music beforehand. The music is there. God knows what he's doing. The music was put in the, in the, in the, in the, 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 the synagogue. The music was there in order for people to worship to get in the now. The now. Y'all say now. Yeah. Now. The problem is again, right now. And I'll even say it in our, as I'm even talking right now. Some of you are still thinking about yesterday, last week. What should we be doing right now? What should I be doing tomorrow? Who's going to be at work tomorrow? How am I going to get that right? How am I going to get this? Blah, blah, blah. And my challenge again today, and I have to do it every day of my life. My wife tells me all the time. She says, honey, come back to me. Come back to me. We're trying to talk about now, not yesterday, not over here. You know, honey, you just told me five subjects in one sentence. Now. Now. How many here got ADHD? Okay, if y'all understand this. Amen. Some of them are getting pointed at. <laughs> Amen. I resemble that remark. <laughs> okay. So my challenge to you today is, for today, try it. If you don't like it, then it'll give you a refund your ticket that you paid to get in here. Y'all ready? Here we go. All right. The blessings of the unexpected cross. I'm just going to shoot through some some, some stuff from last week, just so everybody can be on board and be together. Uh, last week was Easter, and honestly, it was so awesome just to think about a risen Savior. And like I said that morning, when I got up, I didn't just hear, I am risen, I'm not here, I am risen, saith the Lord. I also heard Bethany. I heard her, this is clear as a bell, saying, Daddy, I'm not here, I am risen, and I'm alive and well. Amen. God's got this. Amen. I keep giving these things away. God's got this. I'm glad I got so many of them. Uh, I went to go buy a piece of furniture that we that my wife saw on I reckon Wilford County Yard sale, I don't know, but I was in the, in an area in Grantsburg, went to go get it and found out when I got there, they were asking me about this, and I told them some of my daughter had cancer, and I found out the woman's husband had cancer. And so I got a chance to minister to her. It's a God thing. I got a chance to minister to her. I gave her one of these, and, and I told her if ever, she ever needed anything, any help with her husband or anything, just let us know. You know, so, so, so God's got things out there for us if we can live in the now. Now. All right? So here we go. The best of the unexpected cross. Now, of course, Simon of Cyrene, I'm going to go through this first part really quick, okay? The Bible says he was compelled, which means literally compelled means that they pulled him into service. He was automatically drafted on the spot. He became, it's like when a policeman comes up and takes your car from you. He's in a hot pursuit. His car is taken away, his car crashes, or something happens, or a car takes off. He will come up and say, I need your car for this chase. You give it to him. Okay? You're compelled into service. All right? Same way. They were compelled to service. Uh, and, and he didn't want to do it, so they laid a hold of him. They said, if you don't want to do it, like, if you don't want to be drafted, uh, then we're going to draft you anyway. And so they got a hold of him and they pulled him in. So, so here it is. Again, again, this is really quick because this was... We took a long time on this last week. It was unexpected. It interrupted his routine. He was there from Africa. He was there trying to uh, pay homage and sacrifice unto God. He was uh, uh, a proselyte from another religion. He's going into Christianity, and, and he was trying to pay his yearly homage unto God. So he had traveled a long ways, and then while he's standing there waiting to go pay homage, here comes the cross. Some of y'all right now, you, you're trying to do for God. He was trying to do for God. He was doing his best for God, but in the middle of doing his best for God, here comes something he didn't expect. And it was powerful, too, because it made a difference. So here's the four things his cross did for him, and, and after this, we're going to go ahead and jump on in, okay? Uh, first thing is, the four things the cross did for Simon, number one, was it brought him into the presence of Jesus. He was so close to Jesus, he could feel his breath. 
and he could hear his voice. I think about some of the worst times I've been in. I thought about those eight months when Dr. Bethany was diagnosed, those eight months. And, and there's times where I was going to walk out in the hall, I talked to the doctor and just pull my hair out. There was times I literally just had to go and I said, Dr. Bethany said, where are you going, Dad? And I said, I'll be right back. I'm just going out to stretch my legs. I was actually going out to pray because of information we just had or something I had seen and I didn't like what I saw. And, and I was out just talking to the Lord. But you know what I found out? In those eight months, it drew me closer to God than I'd ever been. And I could hear his voice in a different, a different way. If you've been through something tough, I can tell you, you hear God's voice in a different way. Amen? Think about it. Think about your toughest things you've been through. You now, first off, there might be some rebellion. And you got to get through the rebellion. You're saying, God's not talking to me at all. Once you get through all that, get through that fog, you start to hear God. You hear God speak to you different than you've ever heard before. And it's a powerful way he talks. It also made him follow the steps of your Savior. <clears throat> We're no better than Jesus Christ. He took his cross. He wants us to take ours. And made him part of the greatest work in the world. He carried Jesus' cross up the Calvary's hill to be crucified. When we carry our cross, we actually carry, we carry Jesus to the spot where he needs to be lifted up to help someone. And the cross changes family forever. Let's, let's just go through, this, go through this kind of quickly. All right. So, again, here it is. His cross was unexpected. It was powerful. <clears throat> and it was productive because it carried this message. And here was, here was the message. Uh, first one, <coughs> Jesus carried the cross first. Before Simon was ever involved, Jesus started taking up the cross. I want you to remember this, Isaiah 53, he was a man of sorrows, he, he bore our iniquities, he, he carried our, our, our sins, he carried our sickness, he, he, he took care of it all. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has taken you, which is not common unto man. So, so we see these right here now. So watch this. Remember this. Whatever happens to you, remember this. Jesus has already been there. He's already carried your cross to the point you pick it up. Whether you believe it or not, whether you see it or not, it's true. He's already been there. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says, We have not a high priest which cannot be touched. He's been there. That's why I say he's been there. And he can be touched. I, I remember I remember one time, uh, and I've told this a thousand times, and I'll tell it again. Uh, I remember one time a, a, a man come to me that lost his child, and he said, and he said, Pastor, can you tell me where was God when my son died? Where was he at? And I prayed about it, and I prayed about it, and I went back to him, and I said, I got you an answer. He says, you got me an answer? I said, yeah, I got you an answer. He said, where was God at when my son died? I said, the same place he was at when his son died. He was on the throne and in control. And was pulling, and was using, I mean, he was still in control. Everything was there. God was still in control. Somebody say, he's always in control. That's right. So first, Jesus carried the cross first. All right, this, that was from last week. Here we go. Also, Jesus shares the load. Tradition in history tells us that Jesus and Simon carried it in tandem. Uh, uh, Simon carried the cross on one shoulder and carried Jesus over the other shoulder. And so, when you look at this, 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13 says, We are partakers <clears throat> in his suffering. <clears throat> Therefore, rejoice. There have been so many times I had to stop and just thank God. Just thank him. I don't understand it. <clears throat> it doesn't make sense. Even on the way up here this morning, you know, I thought about some things that, that we go through from time to time as family. We go through individually, go through as a church. I think about these things, and I was on the way up here, and I was... I was I was actually doing some praise and worship in my mind. And as I began to think about this, I had to stop and just say, thank you, God. I got a lot of, how many's got a lot of ouchies in your life? It hurts. I thought, I thank God for every ouchie. I said, Lord, I thank you for the ouchies. Because for every ouchie I've got, I know you carry thousands more. And I thank you, God, that you're helping me carry this now. I remember DC and Daniel. <coughs> When they were youngins, and my wife, uh, Beverly, would say, you need to go tear them up. I said, okay. And, uh, and DC will remember this. I, I'd carry them in the back room, and I'd say, okay, get ready. And I'd put them on my leg, and I'd take my hand, and i said, now, I'm going to hit me too. <laughs> I said, so make it good. 
And sometimes I wouldn't even tell him I was doing it. I would just do it. And so as I'm hitting their hiney, I'm hitting my leg at the same time. And the loudness was coming from my hand on my leg, not on their hiney. And even if they didn't know to start with, they didn't know what I was doing. I'm hitting like this. They didn't realize I was taking the blood of the blood. Beth, they told us when we first got her, not to spike her. And I couldn't get her to behave. And she'd been had such a rough life, and I could not get her to behave. And I couldn't get her to stop coming and walking up in the pool pit while I was preaching. And, and she just kept doing some things and running and hiding and all kinds of things. And so I said, I know what they said, but I know what God said too. And I said, come here, girl. I said, now, now you won't listen. I said, so what I'm getting ready to do, I don't want to do, but I've got to do because I love you too much to let you keep doing this. And I turned her over. D.C. cried, Daniel cried, Beverly cried, I cried. I started spiking Pally Beth, and then she was crying. But again, I hit my leg harder than I hit her hiney. And so she heard that noise and felt a little bit of pain, and she screamed. You'd have thought I'd have killed her. When I got down, I was crying for two reasons. One, because I had to do it, too, because I just beat my leg. Amen. <clears throat> Think about this. If Jesus wasn't helping you, can you imagine how heavy your cross was? Can you even imagine how it would be without his guidance and comfort? The Bible says also that we're laborers together in him, and his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He will yoke up with you, and when you yoke up, you'll carry more things you ever thought you could carry because you're yoked up to his strength. So, here it is. Jesus shares the load. You know, a fear would paralyze us if it wasn't for his help. Jeremiah 29 11, it says, I'm giving you a hope and expected end or things that you long for. Look at somebody who says it's not always going to be like this. I got a challenge for you. You don't have to raise your hands. <clears throat> but how many have things in your life that you wish would change? Relationships. Don't have to raise your hands. How many have relationships with people at work that you wish would change? How many have people in your life that are EGRs, extra grace required? Every time you get around them, you have to have extra grace because you can't handle them on your own. You're asking God to fix it. Now, sometimes we ask God to fix it by taking them out of our life. But that's not the way to solve it. There's many times God's going to sit there with your husband or wife or with your children or with family members or with at your work with people. And God will change them and you. My question is, once he brings the change, can you accept the change and be positive about it and thank God for it and move forward? Or are you going to sit back, grab a hold of the pain and hold on to it, 80% in the past? All you can do is hold on to the pain. And as God's working miracles, you're saying God's not working. God's working, but you're not working with him. Just like, that's just someone to put in the back of your mind just to think about because I feel like some people are going to get ready to see some things change and you've got to be ready when God does that. Alright? <clears throat> Matthew 28 says, I'll be with you all the way, the whole period, when you're going good, when you're doing bad, when you're sick, when you're well, when everything's going your way, when everything's not going your way, I'm still with you. So Jesus shares the load. Somebody say he shares my load. Watch this one now. Not only does he share the load, he preps us to carry the cross. Think about this now. He preps us. Why did he pick? Here's a good question. Why did he pick Simon? Why didn't he pick a Roman soldier? You know why? The reason that God didn't pick a Roman soldier to carry that cross is this was a religious problem. And the soldiers were already in too deep. They weren't, they, they're, just, they're just trying to keep peace in the town. The priests are the ones that brought Jesus to them, and the priests are the ones that are making the big thing about it. Religion is what's killing Jesus. Our sin is what's killing Jesus. But, but, the, but the Romans wanted to keep peace, and so the Romans, in order to keep peace, would have to kill Jesus. So this was a religious problem. This was not their problem. It was not a state problem. And they were already in too deep. So, so, so a soldier couldn't do it. Why not a disciple? They ran. Have you ever missed an opportunity to serve God because you ran? 
I'll leave that right there. <laughs> God has used every hardship in your life to prepare you for the cross that you now carry. Romans 8, 28, all things, are, all things itself are not for our good, but all things work together for our good. For them to love the Lord and call it according to His purpose. God's got a plan for us, amen. Uh, uh, 1 Samuel 17, He said, I fought the lion and I fought the bear, and that prepared him to fight the lion. He said, the battle's not mine. Can somebody say the battle's not mine? This battle's not mine. This battle is not mine. This battle is not mine. You know, just, all, all I can hear, I keep hearing this, and, and uh, uh, as I keep hearing this in my head, I hear it over and over and over again. Not only do I hear God's got this, and I hear Bethany saying it, but here's what I hear Bethany saying all the time. All the time, I hear it every day. Here it is. Either way, Dad, I win. Either way, I win. Somebody reminded me of that just yesterday. They said, I remember your daughter saying something. What was that? Either way, I win. I said, there you go, Lord. You just keep putting it in my mind. Every, anyway, no matter what happens, I win. She won. She won. The cancer didn't win. She won. She's got whatever she needs now there because she's with Jesus. Also, Jesus has a purpose and a destiny <coughs> for his cross. There's a destined place where you're going to lay that cross down. <laughs> Let me say that again. There's a destined place that you're going to lay your cross down. You won't carry it one inch farther than God planned for you to carry it. Think about this now. That's what I was talking about a while ago. When God picks that cross off your, up off your shoulder, are you going to be ready to do whatever it takes? To move forward. You won't care one inch farther than Calvary. There's a crown to obtain. You know, uh, I sit back and I, and I think about it and I see it. And, 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 and it just it just amazes me. The crowns that are coming our way. If we can just realize for every cross, there's a crown. I mean, never heard the bishop sing for every cross there's a crown. Man, it's the first song I think I've ever heard in my life. Love that song. For every cross there's a crown. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. So I said we're getting closer. Okay, and I'm, I'm getting closer too. I told you I'm trying to hurry up because there's so many of this. All right, I'm going get, to get, get y'all through this. All right, there's a crown on the other side of this cross. Get ready, here we go. You were never to intend it carry the cross for eternity. There's a place you're going to pick it up, and there's a place you're going to lay it down. Some of us already picked them up, right? <laughs> you're going to lay it down. I promise you're going to lay it down. Jesus uses our cross as an example. Here we go. This is where I really wanted to show you something that's really, really, really strong. Let me put a Bible out. Get your Bible out. I want you to see this. Turn to Acts. Chapter 13. Now, Simon could have been resentful because he was, pulled, he was a rich man, pulled out of the crowd. He was used to having people help him, not him helping people. He was used to being in control. And as he's carrying his cross, he's not in control anymore. He has to walk that seven-mile journey, wherever he picked it up at. It may have been on the beginning of the seven mile, it could have been in the middle of the seven miles. I don't know, but somewhere in that seven-mile journey, Simon picked up that cross. He could have been resentful. But he wasn't. Matter of fact, he went from resentful to responsibility. Acts 13 and 1. Now there were in the church that was in Antioch. Certain and Antioch is, is after Jerusalem was the church center, the next church center is Antioch. Alright? 
Now there was at the church there that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simon, that is called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene. You know what I'm talking about? Simon of Cyrene. Simon of Cyrene now is a preacher. Wow. Wow. Now turn to Romans chapter 16. You never know what effect you have on people. You know, I, 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 I walked up someplace not long ago. I walked in a place, and there was a guy that used to come to our house and stay there all the time for years. I, can't, I ain't going to tell you his whole name, but his first name was Rudy. And DC knows exactly who I'm talking about. And I walked up one day not long, it had to be a couple weeks ago, and he walks up to me in some store, and his hair has changed, and he's changed, and he's no longer a teenager. How old are you, D.C.? 38? 37? Rudy's your age, right? Daniel's age, 35. Okay? So he looks a little different than he when he was in his teens. He's 35 now. I walk in the store... I remember this guy stayed with us all the time. We did all kinds of things together. There was times where even he participated with us in Christmas. And, and, and D.C. and Daniel just blew me away because he was going to stay with us over Christmas. And D.C. and Daniel said, Daddy, come here. And I said, what? They said, can you take one of our presents each and give it to Rudy? He doesn't have anything. That was awesome. But I remember this guy, Rudy, but I hadn't seen him in years. I mean years. He walks in, I don't know if it was Walmart if it was Walgreens, I have no idea where it was at. All I remember is he came walking in. I had to look at him two or three times and just know who he was. And he hollered, he hollered, Mr. David, Mr. David. And I said, why? And when he came up to me, he grabbed me and he squeezed me really, really hard. And after he squeezed me, whoever he was with, he looked back and said, this is the closest thing I have. He's my second dad. And I had no idea that I had that effect on him. Hadn't seen him in years. And he thanked me for all we did for him. And again, it was just us being us. I didn't even think about that. So look at here. Simon carrying that cross. It affected him. He went into the ministry. Now his wife is affected. Romans 16 and 13. Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother, or and, and mine. So now we're talking about his his his. Uh, well, actually, it's his mother, but still, you see here, his mother became a mother of the church. Romans sixteen and thirteen. Great Rufus and his mother. Great Rufus and his mother and mine. Rufus, of course, is Simon. Now, one more time. Turn to Mark chapter fifteen. And they compelled one Simon of Serene who passed by coming out of the country. The father, they don't use your names in the Bible. This is going to be used for a purpose. The father of Alexander and Rufus to bear the cross. Why is Mark calling out Simon of Cyrene's children? And I'm sorry I did. It was his wife because it was Rufus' mother. Well, it was a church. Alexander and Rufus to bear the cross. Alexander and Rufus to follow Alexander and Rufus. Now, 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 turn to Romans 16 one more time.
again. Salute Rufus, which is Simon's son, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Now I want you to see something here. Rufus became the bishop of Spain. Alexander became a disciple and was martyred for Christ. Wow. How many ever thought that Simon and Cyrene's story stopped? At Calvary, when he carried that cross, it stopped there. It didn't. It affected his wife. It affected his kids. It affected his legacy. He carried on for Jesus. Not he carried on for Jesus. His children carried on for Jesus. And what I want you to know right here is, watch this. Here it is. There. I won't even. I look. Look, I was going right along and didn't even pay attention to that. I didn't even pay attention to my PowerPoint. I was getting into it so much. Okay, let me get on by here. Let's see. Bruce became the Bishop of Spain. Alexander was martyred for Christ. Just no wonder I got the wrong PowerPoint up there. That's why. I was thinking, what is going on here? All right. Look at somebody say, you never bury your cross in vain. DC, come on up here. Simon and Cyrene had a fault that day and refused to carry the cross. Number one, he would have been locked up and or killed. Another would have been locked up and killed. He would have never affected the world like he did. It's just enough to say, I carry Jesus' cross. Simon did more than just bear his cross. It changed that man. It changed to the point that he ministered and became a key leader in the church. His wife became a mother of the church. His children became leaders in the church. Wow. I bet you he didn't see any of this that day when he was walking with that cross. And for the benefit of y'all that weren't here last week, I'm going to tell this story again. If y'all were here last week, you'll hear it again, but that's okay. The historian of that day went to Simon and Cyrene and said, what do you think about Jesus and this cross and you carrying it? He said, well, he said, I couldn't understand why this good man was being tortured like this. And he said, I didn't volunteer to take the cross. He said, I was yanked out of the crowd. I didn't understand why I was being yanked out of the crowd. I, it just told me. I didn't understand. He said, and they made me pick up his cross. Remember now, cross weighs between 150 and 250, somewhere around there, pounds. And so he said, I remember I got up under the cross under one arm. And he said, I looked down and I saw this bloody pulp of a man head bleeding, ripped to pieces. So it didn't even look like a man. He said, there he was, and tears were coming out of his eyes. And he said, and I had this cross up on this old arm, he said, with the other shoulder. He said, Jesus looked up at me, with tears in his eyes, and in agony. And said, he put his hand on my other shoulder. And we stood up and we walked all the way to Calvary's Hill. They asked him, true story, they asked him would he do it again if he had
had the opportunity, he said a thousand times yes. He said, I'd do it a thousand times. Very easy. I would do it. He said, but only under one condition. He said, you got to understand, that day when I got up under that cross, it was heavy. I got up under my shoulder, and I picked it up, and I, and I was called to carry him in the cross too, and he said, but when Jesus put his hand on my other shoulder, he said, I never felt the weight of that cross all the way to Calvary's hill. He said, I will gladly carry the cross again for Jesus with this condition. I'll put the cross on one shoulder, and Jesus puts his hand on my other shoulder. How many have never seen and know the impact 
that cross made on Simeon and his family, or Simon and his family. Simon and his family all wind up getting working for God and doing for God. How many of you have seen that? I, did anybody look around? You just raise a hand. I've never seen that. Okay, here's what I want you to think about right now. The reason I ask that is you don't understand the impact that you're making on people right now carrying the cross. Like I didn't understand Rudy. And it wasn't just Rudy. I've had guys that hung around the house all the time. Multiple guys come up to me and say, man, you're like a second dad to me. Thank you for being there. I didn't even know. I had no idea. I had people I pastor come up to me and say, man, I am so glad that I got a chance to run into you. I want to tell you just how much you meant my life. I'm going, I had no idea. And just recently, I can't tell you how many people come to me and said, I thank God for you. And you showed me something from Bethany. I'm thinking, I was a wet rag. I was a wet noodle. But again, not bragging on me at all. There's nothing to brag about. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I would gladly have taken her place. I would have died in her place. And it hurts every day of my life. I'm not talking about that. What I'm saying is, I didn't realize the impact that it was having on others. Something special is going to happen to you as you continue to bear this cross because there's going to come a place where you put it down and when you put it down, God's going to do something special. If you believe that, I want everybody to raise your hand. We're going to pray again together. Ready? Ready together, Lord. This cross hurts. I need your help. I don't want to fall under it. I give it to you right now. Lord, I do this for your glory, not mine. I ask you to show me, tell me, hold me. That's awesome. All the time. 